Welcome to Psych Tech. My name is Josue Cardona, and with me always is Kelly Dunlap. And today we're going to talk a little psychology and technology as usual. Uh, a few times in the past, we've talked about some TV shows, and we always kind of touch base and see what kind of what, what, what we're thinking about. And lately, I've been thinking a lot about just uh, you remember that scene in the Matrix when uh, Neo just like gets plugged into the computer and all of a sudden he knows Kung Fu. I know Kung Fu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's it's always been like this really cool scene. And, you know, I think a lot of people have thought about, man, I wish I could do something like that. Like, have you ever – I think about that all the time. Do you? Well, yeah, especially with my uh, my new classes. I wish I could just upload how do I 3D model in Blender directly to my brain. It would it would save me a lot of time and headaches. <laughs> how's it, How's that going, by the way? I don't want to talk about it. Gotcha. So, <laughs> so lately, especially in the past couple of years, last couple of years, I've felt like I'm a lot closer to that because I consume a lot of audiobooks, a lot of podcasts, and it, like it just just the audiobooks alone, um, I can be doing something else and then listen to the audiobook, and now I'm consuming just a whole lot more information than I used to. So sometimes I feel like I'm getting closer to that than than we ever have before. And that's really that's been really exciting to me. And, and one of the things that has been most interesting has been learning about learning, like learning how memory works. And and so lately I've been thinking, wait a minute. So even if we could um, actually do that and upload information into our brains, or or if, uh, like for example, how long did it take for Neo to start forgetting Kung Fu? Right, like he learned it really quickly. But the way our brains work, that's not going to stick around unless he's practicing every day. And and inevitably, it's going to start just going away. And and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today, kind of that, that concept. Like, is that even possible? Can we do that? And if we did, is it is it does it make sense? Like, would it would it work long term? So so I guess the, the place to start would be to talk about how memory works to be able to really have this discussion. So I figured I would start out with a test for you. <gasps> okay. So I'm going to test your memory. If this is embarrassing, I'm cutting it. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you five words, okay. and I want you to just repeat those words back to me. Okay. But I also want you to remember those words because I'm going to ask you to repeat them back to me again at a later time. Got it. Okay. So your five words, I'm going to say all five, and then I want you to say all five back. And if you're, if you're following along at home, feel free to, to talk out loud. Nobody will think it's weird. All right. Face, velvet, church, daisy, red. Face, church, velvet, daisy, red. All right. So now we can move on. That, that was our first memory test. That is your immediate recall. So that is the stuff that just kind of pings around in your in your brain momentarily. And that's how all memories start, is with some kind of external information or some kind of internal process. There's something that triggers an event in the brain. So in this case, it is my, it is my voice and it is your, uh, your auditory memory that is working. So what just happened is you heard my voice and your brain was like, I need to pay attention to this because she told me I'm going to have to remember these things. So your auditory memory is less than a second. It's very, very fast. And then from there, it moves into your short term memory, which can hold things for about 30 seconds unless they're refreshed. So right now, these five words are bouncing around in your short term memory. And we will see if, uh, if it get in gets encoded into your long term memory. You know, I usually can't remember a phone number. Like I have to read, like I have to memorize three and then three and then four. <laughs> uh, that's, so, that's totally normal though. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was a little worried about the five words. <laughs> All right. All right. That was good. Okay. Okay. So, so, so what else happens? Like what, so there's this prompt, right? It starts, uh, what's going on? Like what is actually going inside on inside my head? Where are those words now? Where are they going? Well, see, that's the interesting thing is that scientists don't really know. We yeah. know what memory is not. So people have this idea that they're like Neo, that they learn something, it gets uploaded to their brain, and then it kind of stays there in a file or like a, like a book on the shelf. And that's not true at all. 
for if I say the word, I'm going to make up a word, if I say the word unicorn, there are about 15 different places in your brain that are lighting up to bring a memory of what a unicorn is to your consciousness. So for example, you have part of your brain that's imagining the image of a unicorn. There's a part of your brain that is taking the language of the word of what I'm saying and ascribing meaning to the word unicorn. Another part of your brain is going back and thinking about other times that you have seen about, seen about, seen or heard um, about unicorns. And there's the emotional part of your brain that's sensing, do I feel some kind of way about unicorns? Or have I ever had an emotional experience about unicorns? And all these different parts of the brain are working together in just the fastest you can even imagine to bring to mind the idea, the image, the concept of a unicorn. So those five words are bouncing around and they're going to the different centers of your brain. So the processing of the language, the grammar, are they related to anything? Are these words you've heard before? And if so, where have you heard them? Are these important words to remember? Are they not? How much are we going to attend to them? So there's about a bazillion processes uh, that might be a little, I don't know, that might be high or low. I'm not sure. But it's all going on simultaneously. And that's about as much as scientists know. We know the parts of the brain that are involved. So like the frontal cortex and the hippocampus and the thalamus. And there's all these different other brainy bits that are involved in the processing of memories. And we just, we don't know a whole lot about it, but we do know that it is not a book. We know that it is not a computer file that sits there forever. Yeah, and it is, so every single memory is like a web, right? So it's got connections all over the place. And the more connections you have, um, like all of those things that you mentioned about a unicorn, in our case right now, we know what a unicorn is. So we're kind of retrieving those memories. But if it were the first time that we that we learned what a unicorn was, we'd have that image. We'd have the color. We'd have where we were at the moment. We'd have the sound of the word. And all of those things would be part of that memory uh, associated to that word unicorn. And you're right. Uh, like many things in the brain, scientists are kind of just guessing and the ways that the different ways that people explain how it works at least over time it's making more and more sense to me right but i think yeah everybody has different analogies which are pretty interesting but everybody agrees it is not a filing cabinet it is not a file it is not something that's neatly packed away a memory is not one thing so what's interesting is the idea that long-term memory, so things like remembering your name and the day you were born and your mother's face, those are things that are in the brain and they don't ever leave. That's one of the big theories right now is that it's it's always there. It's just whether or not we can access it or whether or not we properly stored it away in our brain. But what I found was really interesting, and I was kind of brushing up on my neuroanatomy right before this podcast, was that the moment something almost becomes a memory. So like it goes through auditory processing, you hear the word unicorn and you're deciding whether or not in that split second that that's worth remembering. That's called an engram. Like in destiny, it's an engram. I know I'm smiling. I'm smiling. Yeah. I, 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 I hate engrams. I love engrams, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. I didn't, I didn't find that. Cool. Yeah. So I thought that was super interesting yeah. that not only is there a word for it, but it's a word that I can almost guarantee you anybody who plays Destiny will remember from here on out because of that association. And that's one of the things that can improve your memories is taking a new piece of information and attaching it to an older piece of information that's already kind of dug in. Yeah, like um, have you seen Sherlock? Oh, of course. Right. So, you know, uh, they play around with this idea of the mind palace, right? That's a concept that's pretty um, popular right now. And... Different ways to explain it are just like, you know, telling a story or making those additional connections. Just like maybe to remember someone's name, you kind of, you know, make up a, an anagram with the letters of their name or, or you tell a story that can kind of help you remember a fact, right? But you're making up this whole story just so you have more connections and more ways to, to kind of reinforce it in your brain. Yeah, more ways to access it. Yeah, yeah. And and I guess the more connections you have, the stronger that initial connection is. And um, apparently, like, variety also helps with that. So um, one thing I've, I've discovered is that if you re- even if when you review information and you do it in a different place or in a different way, 
it can help you remember the thing more instead of just doing it the same exact way because you're building different connections to kind of reinforce that initial connection. What's so interesting is that a lot of study tips say to do the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're going to be studying in a particular room in a particular seat, you really should study in that place as much as possible because the surroundings can act as triggers or cues to also bring back that memory. Yeah, there's research that, that goes completely against that. There have been experiments in recent years where they've had even silly things, even just like having the teacher have his hair differently or, or his or her hair differently and sitting students in different places, completely changing the classroom, redecorating it, um, sitting outside instead of sitting inside. Uh, and just reintroducing the same information in different ways can help reinforce that. And yeah, schools don't do that. Some schools do have like block schedules that change from day to day. And, you know, it's real different from like once you're in college, it's very different than when you're in grade school and high school. And, you know, every day for a lot of students, every single day is exactly the same. For others, it's a little different. Right. But for most students, it's exactly the same thing every day. And you even have assigned seats and just nothing changes in that environment. So I on that topic, I would wonder if it's not necessarily the variety, like the inside, the outside, the hair up, the hair down. I wonder if rather than being the different situation, it's just a different way of getting attention. Because obviously you, you need to be able to attend in order to be able to create memories. Like you have to be able to take the information and go, hey, this is important. I need to pay attention to it. And if you're spacing out and not listening to your teacher, then that encoding process just isn't going to happen. However, if we happen to notice, hey, my teacher's hair is different, or hey, man, we're outside, this is awesome, you're changing your emotional state, and emotions have a really big impact on what we remember and how we remember it. That's a, that's a good question, but maybe like I'll counter that with what if all of this variety is actually distracting and pulls you away from the actual actually being able to focus on the lesson or the thing that you're actually trying to learn. I think it's just a matter of how you attend and how you learn. So for me, I tend to be an auditory learner. I just do better when I can hear something reasoned out as opposed to necessarily seeing it. So if I was in a place that was really loud and noisy, I would have a very difficult time attending to anything. So I think it, there, I mean, there are different ways of learning. There's different styles, but it, it really is interesting. That The most important thing is that repetition works. So if you're trying to learn something, whether you're learning it in the same way or you're trying to learn it in different ways, the repetition is, is ultimately what's really, really important. So, so on, on the topic of repetition, it is, so the way the memory works, right? If you could see a memory, imagine it like a, uh, an engram, imagine it like an engram, a but legendary, also, a legendary a, engram. Yes. And imagine it has, uh, like some sort of tentacles or something like that. Like those on Zero's face. That's a, that's a very, uh, that's a destiny deep cut, right? But imagine it has all these like tendrils or something, right? Sticking out of it um, and grasping at different places, right? So over time, those um, strands kind of start getting weaker and you can actually start making some of those connections. And then that repetition reinforces those connections. And then the more you, you reinforce them, the stronger the memory, the easier it is to get it back when you need it. But the topic of repetition is really interesting because over time, the memory dissipates, right? It's disappearing. Those connections get weaker. But a lot of research, I'm talking about like for 100 years, people have been studying how fast you lose a memory. So there's, there's a lot out there um, on the topic of uh, spaced repetition, which it talks about the fact that if you, if you study it this morning and then you study it again this afternoon and then you study it a third time today, that's kind of worthless because when you studied it this morning, it was already pretty strong and the gains, like the, the increase in strength of that memory by doing it two more times in the same day isn't really effective. But if you wait a couple days and then, the, um, and then a few days more and then a few days more, overall, you'll do a lot more to reinforce the memory because there's that moment where it's kind of weak and when it's kind of weak if right there you go and you reinforce it it kind of bumps up the strength to a point where it'll last longer and you can keep addressing what you've learned or these these memories uh over time with something like space repetition and then really 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 be able to keep it into what's considered long-term memory 
because it's so strong. And then the way you train that is not very different from the way you would train a muscle. Just that we can we can actually measure. I mean, it depends on you know everybody. It's a little different, but you can actually measure how long it takes you to forget something, in order to address how to kind of keep it for longer. Well, on on that topic, it is now time for you to repeat those five words back to me. Church, Daisy. That's all I got. I don't remember anything else. All right. So now this is this is the fun words? part. Th- those, yeah, that's right. Church and Daisy were two words. And now we're, we're going to go to the part where you. I'm pretty sure that you encoded it. And maybe you just need a prompt. So it's in your brain somewhere. The other three words are in there. And I'm going to help you find the road to them by giving you a prompt. So one was a color. I got nothing. Oh, my goodness. Okay, one was a, a fabric. Nope. One was a body part. Face. There you go. Okay, so we got that one. Do you want to guess at the color or the or the? Uh... I know lots of colors. No, I don't want to. Okay, guess. the color <laughs> the color starts with R. Red. Yep, and then okay. the the fabric started with a V. Velvet. Yep. So again, I don't know any other fabric that starts with a V. <laughs> but that's how your memory is working: is that your brain is pulling for it, and it's finding a bazillion different ways to get to the information. And whether it's relying on old information that's already there, such as V, velvet. That's the only fabric I know that starts with a V. That must be it. And that's a retrieval process as opposed to church and daisy, which you managed to just pull out of your synapses. Yeah, yeah. Those just seemed like the most random for, to me uh, at the moment um, when you said them. I don't know why. They kind of stuck. I don't know. I was going to cheat. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. don't be a cheater. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, was there anything about those two words that stuck to you? Do they have any significance to you? Is there anything that maybe you could hang your hat on with those two words in particular? Uh, no, 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 not really. Okay. And that's fine. I mean, again, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't mean that you're, you have Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean that you're, you're old and losing your memory. But that's a perfect example of how you are immediately able to repeat them all back to me. But then over the space of about five to ten minutes... You lost connection with three of them, and you were able to, when cued, re- retrieve the other three. And and this really is a good example of how, you know, if, if for example, if the way we're presenting information to, for example, in education uh, to our to kids in school, if we're just presenting them, presenting it to them in a way that is kind of just like that list that you kind of threw at me, and then we kept going on to something else, you know, are these are are we learning something if that's the way that we are? being provided information versus doing a project or doing something with a lot more connections. Yeah. Memorization and learning are two entirely different constructs. I asked you to memorize that list. There is nothing in that list that is relevant to you. There's nothing really in that list that has any meaning. But if I were to say like his face was red like velvet as he sat in church with a daisy in his hand, I bet you could have remembered Put it probably all five because it was put into a story. Or, for example, if, say, Daisy was your mother's favorite flower or something like that, then there's, that, again, that connection that you can hang a memory on. So it's not just kind of out in the wilderness. It's already got a bit of an anchor to it in your brain. Yeah. But instead, you just gave me the information I needed for the test. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> so that's, again, that's a totally different kind. And another thing to keep in mind is in addition to... Uh, immediate short-term and long-term memories. I mean, that's just kind of the duration that we have in our brains. There's a lot of different kinds of memory. So for example, there is procedural memory, and that is what enables us to do the same task over and over and over and over again. So for example, if you're driving your car and you're going to work, the same thing you do every single day, there's a procedure. You sit down, you buckle your seatbelt, you put it in reverse, you check your mirrors, you do all this stuff, and then you go to work, and you change lanes, and you do all of this, and you don't really think about it. Unless you're a new driver, then you probably think about it more. But I know for me, I can go from my house to my job and not really remember how I got there because I'm on autopilot, and it's because I have those memories, my brain is pulling those memories, and I don't actually have to consciously think about what I'm doing. But I'm a safe driver, so I'll, I'll put that out there. 
Yeah, and there's research about people who have no um, short-term memory because of brain damage and things like that, but yeah. they're still able to learn things like procedural memory. So they could learn how to get to their home even if they don't remember where it is. You know, There's a lot of really interesting research on that. And that just is contributing to the idea that memory is not in one place. For a while, it was thought it was contained almost entirely in the hippocampus, which if you want a fun memory trick, what I did in undergrad is I thought of hippocampus and memory. So a hippo is like an elephant, and elephants never forget. So therefore, the hippocampus is where memory is. Very good. And Very good. So, so again, that's, it's not rocket science. It's me taking something that's completely foreign, this hippocampus thing, and ascribing it to something I know. So that now, 10 years later, I still remember that little acronym. And and the more we learn about how our memory works, the more we can improve it, without a yes. doubt. Yes. So in addition to procedural memory, there's working memory. That's the kind of memory that is somewhere between short-term and long-term. So for example, it can be there longer than the 30 seconds of short-term memory, but it might not be crystallized into long-term memory. So think of something that you did and you did it a bit and then you just kind of lost it, if that makes sense. It's, it's, it's very squishy and nebulous uh, working memory is, but it's something you're doing like in that moment. Uh, for example, the, the repetition of those words, asking you to recall it five minutes later, that was working memory. And then there's there's declarative memory, there's uh, semantic memory, there is autobiographical memory. Um, one of my favorite studies was about, um, there was a gentleman who had, I think he had really severe encephalitis, so brain swelling, and he forgot everything. He didn't know his family, he didn't know his name, he didn't know where he was, but he was a, a master pianist, and he could still play everything. He, he did not lose that part of his memory. So again, just the fact that there's different parts of our memory that are located in different parts of the brain. And again, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily agree with each other in the brain science world. But I mean, it's great to be able to have this terminology so that we can kind of try to make sense of something that we don't completely understand. So when you were talking about how long would it be before Neo forgot Kung Fu, I guess my counter argument would be he uses Kung Fu a lot. So unless he retires, I don't think he's really going to lose the Kung Fu. I yeah. know a really great example is I went to school at first to study Russian. And so I took two years of Russian language and I was pretty good. I, I wouldn't say I was fluent, but if you dropped me in the middle of Moscow, I could definitely navigate my way around the city. And it's been, you know, several years since I studied Russian, and I, I don't really have anybody to talk Russian to. So it's kind of slipped away. I had this really great piece of knowledge, and I used to be pretty good at it. And now it's kind of gone. I know it's still in my brain, because when I hear people speaking Russian, or I read Russian on TV, or I, or I see it in some other kind of way, I hear two babushkas talking on the, on the metro, it starts to come back. And the more I'm around it, the more I remember and the more I pick up. So it's that cued recall. You know, I might not be able to remember Face Velvet Church Daisy Red in Russian, but then when someone starts speaking in Russian, going, wait a minute, I do know that. That is in there. Let me go back and retrieve that, that little nugget that's, that's been hiding from me. And the, the scene from the movie that I was thinking about the most when, when I was thinking about this topic was actually the part where um, they get to the, the – Trinity and Neo get to the roof of the building and there's a helicopter there. And Neo asks Trinity, do you know how to fly that thing? And she's like, not yet. Boom. They upload it and then now she can learn how to fly the, the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the scene that made me think, I wonder how soon it took her to forget it because that is definitely something that they're not doing all the time. Right. If yeah. – I mean, if, let's say, in the fifth Matrix movie that... Um, oh, I hope so. <laughs> ...that Trinity has to fly a helicopter, I guess, realistically, as, as much as that word can count here, I would imagine that it would be... She might need to have a refresher course. But on the other hand, the fact that it was an incredibly emotional situation where she learned that in, she might actually hold on to it really, really well. And that is both a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing for Trinity, because she can still remember how to fly the helicopter, but a really bad thing for, I mean, that's basically what PTSD is, is the re-experiencing of a memory that you can't let go. 
And even if that memory was 20 years ago, the fact that you're reliving it every single day keeps it keeps it fresh. Yeah, I describe it to some of my clients. Like, um, it's like your your brain was stamped like really, really hard with that memory. Yeah. So it's harder to forget it than than something else. And um, something else really important to remember is it's not your brain does not say take a photo and file it away. That's not how it works. Every single time you pull on a memory, you're pulling on the memory of the memory. So, for example. If you want to think about something in your past, like what you had for breakfast, you're not actually remembering what you had for breakfast. You're remembering your previous memory about what you had for breakfast, and so it's kind of like a game of telephone where it, the word or the memory gets whispered from you know child to child, and by the end, it's not what it was, or usually is not what it was when it started. And so, if you're pulling a memory constantly. It's changing pretty much every single time you pull it. Not not in a large way, not always, but little things can change, and they do change. So just, I mean, that opens up a whole can of worms regarding you know witness testimonies and false memories and implanted memories. But that's an important thing to know about memory is is how fallible it is. Memory sucks. Human it, memory is absolutely garbage. Well, actually, not really. <laughs> I, I no, just, it's garbage. Garbage. To split hairs, technically speaking, most researchers agree that the human brain has the processing power for an infinite amount of memories. Unfor I've got issues with that. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, Go unfortunately, our ability to properly encode those memories and to retrieve those memories is where we get screwed. It's because that is not infinite. So it's the idea that if we learn something and it's encoded. So again, it gets past that short-term memory and it gets actually encoded into a longer-term memory that it's always there. We just might not be able to access it. Yeah. Yeah. So our brains could be filled with millions upon trillions and trillions of memories, most of which we might not know because we can't access them. Because uh, like go going back to what's going on in the brain, right? That you have cells that are kind of changing and stretching and, and they have these different connections. And then the synapses, you know, these are electrical signals that are kind of what th the memories are, right? Like the, the just these, uh, something is happening in your nervous system and these electrical signals are happening. So those electrical, like that, your brain has a potential to see and hear so many different things, right? And maybe... At one point, it had a certain combination of all of these electrical signals in different places, but then that exact, like all that electricity isn't necessarily what's stored there. It's just the image of what happened, you know? So you're not actually storing, like like you said, like a, a, a bit of data. You're storing kind of the record, like th that, bit, that bit of data occurred there in a certain way, kind of like... Um, it's like you, an, an electrochemical thumbprint yeah 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 i was thinking kind of like uh, a roll of film right that it can you know that the you can imprint something onto it but the the actual what what you end up with the negative isn't actually the event or the picture it's just kind of the light hitting it in a certain way and then that potential is there and if, does that make sense I think yeah. it makes sense, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then instead of storing that uh, film away, imagine if the film just kind of uh, went faded completely, right? So it has the potential to recreate that image again, but it's not necessarily stored there. I know when I when I work with my clients uh, dealing with memory and particularly trauma, and uh, but just memory in general, as I always like to describe it as as paths. So you're walking along and you come to a hub and there's a trillion paths that are laid out before you. Some of them are, are very well worn. Like you can see the boot prints and all the weeds of the jungle have been beat back. And that is something like driving a car. That is a, a, a routine. That is a path. And it's probably got a rut in it. Like we, ha we use that one so much we have habits. And then there are others that are a little bit overgrown, but you can still traverse them. For example, if I was to try and go back and do algebra, I know it's in there somewhere. I just might need a refresher. So I might need to take my machete and, and hack back a little bit to be able to get to where I want to go. And then there are things in our mind where the path to them has been completely overgrown and no amount of machete hacking can get you back there. And... 
that can be that you could consider as forgetting, like permanent forgetting. It's also the psychological construct of repression is is in there as well. And amnesias. That's another way to think about it. It depends if it's completely overrun or if there's like a wall there that you can't get through. Yeah. So just think about as different ways of obstructing the past and those paths map onto the neurons in your brain. So they, they are, they have little bodies, little center bodies, and then they have different uh, branches, kind of like a tree that come out of them that connect them to other neurons. And so sometimes those connections can be really strong, like driving a car. That's a connection that gets used all the time. Whereas trying to remember my sister's birthday I have to sit there and think about it for a second and, and draw on other memories to make sure that I'm getting that right. And then there are some things that I will just never, ever remember. Like if I was to take a memory test and try to remember five words, remember them a year later, it's not going to happen. Not unless I work at it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and along that same analogy, you could, um, kind of go, over the path and kind of go around and come around another way and, and end up at the same place. Yes. And it may not be the same route you took the first time. <clears throat> but the idea that the more you traverse it, the more you use that, the more you work that muscle, uh, the stronger that connection gets. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so going, going back to, to the matrix, um, another thing I was thinking was, can they, like, okay, so so they've found a way to instantly put that information in their head, right? So kind of um, going back to that uh, negative film uh, analogy or like a painting, like I thought of it that way too. Like maybe the, it's a picture and then you're constantly touching up that painting and maybe sometimes you touch it up a little differently. But over time, if it's if it's completely gone, it's really hard to make it out. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what what is actually – like what kind of things can we do to help us retain memories, right? So I was thinking, all right, so he's learning uh, Kung Fu, for example. Neil's learning Kung Fu. But if he doesn't physically practice it, right, this is where we get into some kind of uh, sci-fi uh, speculation and also not understanding the brain as, as uh, we wish we did, right? But if those are physical movements that he has to do and he's never actually physically doing them, right, does that affect how long he's able to keep them in his memory? Because he never really fights outside of the Matrix. He's always fighting inside the Matrix. So kind of that disconnect, just reviewing things in your head instead of having um, external um, cues and connections. Do you think that would affect how long they could remember stuff? Man, that's that's deep. Because mm-hmm. that, it's... it's... I mean, one of, the, one of the types of memory is muscle memory. And that's what a lot of people are familiar with is if you play a sport or if you play music, you can close your eyes and do it in your sleep. You can not have played a piece in 10 years and it'll just come back to you that easily because it's, it's intuitive and it's, it's the procedure that your body goes through. So the fact that he has never actually physically executed those moves in real life, I think that would probably have a negative effect if we're assuming that the upload somehow is integrated into his organic brain. I tend to think that if you're plugged into the matrix and they're able to alter your perception of reality to where you think you are someplace you are not. So they are basically inducing a hallucination, a very, very real hallucination that there's probably some kind of tech in there as well. So I, I would, and not to say if it's just even chemical, what, what they're doing and how that affects encoding and, and, consolidating of, of information. But I think the fact that he never physically did it in real life, I don't know if it would hurt his chances, but it certainly doesn't help him of retaining that information. And and we've discussed in the past that um, like when you play a video game, you may learn how to do something in the game, but that does not mean at all that you're able to do that same thing in real life. It doesn't matter how much of a simulation it is, um, how realistic the simulation is. Right. Yeah. So it's one thing to rehearse things in your brain. So, for example, if I was Neo and I got to lay in a little pod and have a giant needle oh, shoved into my, you know, brainstem, and I learned kung fu, and while I was in the Matrix, I got to do kung fu, and then I came out of the Matrix and I tried to do kung fu, the reality would be I would probably like sprain and pull every muscle in my body because I 
my body doesn't know Kung Fu. It doesn't know that it should stretch that way. It doesn't know that it doesn't have the physical strength to stand on my hands. So that's another shortfall of it as well, is that this is something that exists only in your mind. Not that that doesn't mean it couldn't stay, but as we've talked about, the more roots you have to access that memory, the better chance you have of keeping access to that memory. Okay. Now, food is really important. Like I you're... love food. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really good relationship with food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's also there's food and then there's there's good food, um, nutritious food. Right. And your brain, just like everything else in your body, uh, needs certain nutrients and things like that. And considering how they're eating in the Matrix, they've got like that slop. Right. Kind of for the most part, although they do say that it has everything the body needs. I wonder, I wonder how good or like, would you even care at that point since you could just re-upload everything? about how good or bad your diet is uh, in terms of helping you keep all that information. I mean, if it's got all the essential ingredients for maintaining a healthy mind and body, then awesome. Psychologically, that rubs me the wrong way. I remember there was, a, there was actually a study of a guy who was complaining. He just wanted bachelor chow, like just on, like on, uh, on Futurama, where it, all the nutri nutrients he needs is in like this kibble format, and then he can just eat it because he was tired of cooking. And after, I think, three days, he was having some very serious mental issues just associated with the lack of variety, with the associated with the lack of basically stimulation for his, his taste buds and uh, the other senses associated with, with food and digestion. And it became a really big issue. So that's, that's what I always think about when I think about the sloth they're eating is, yes, it may be nutritious and full of nutrients, but if you eat the same thing, just try it. Try eating the same thing three meals a day, every day, I can guarantee you, well, I can't guarantee you, but most likely by dinner, you will not ever want to eat that thing again for a very, very long time, if ever. And that you will remember. That's why a lot of uh, people fail when they try a diet because they, they think like just eating the same thing over and over again will be the way to do it. And that, that doesn't work. Nope, you gotta keep you gotta keep the variety. You gotta have single stuffed Oreos and double stuffed Oreos and then the mint Oreos and the Oreos covered in fudge. And when I was in Tennessee I found triple, triple stuffed Oreos because it was cookie, uh white cream, cookie Calm down. Calm chocolate down. cream, cookie, white cream, cookie. It was amazing. Breathe. Breathe, Kelly. I love food. <laughs> and what's also really cool about food is the the sense of smell often associated with food, is actually the only sense that goes directly to the hippocampus. It bypasses the thalamus and goes straight to the hippocampus, if I'm remembering that right. So if there's any neuroscientists listening, be nice. Because it, <laughs> it's the only one that's not mitigated before it goes to the memory centers. What do you think that slop t t uh, smells like, the one of the Matrix? I always get like this tang of metal in my mouth when I think about it. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so for example, if you're walking around and you smell something that and it can trigger a memory. Uh, my favorite example is when I was in undergrad, there was a boy on the floor who had this very distinct cologne. He was also the boy that had the Xbox in his room. And so I used to walk by smelling for his cologne because if I could smell it, that would mean he was up and I could play Halo. And to this day, whenever I smell that cologne, I instantly think of him and of the like the game of halos that we played even though that was goodness uh, 10 years ago yeah it's like uh, that's all part of the same memories you connected one thing with the other so one might spark the memory of of the other yeah or a, another awesome example is when i was little i had a sega genesis and i would play sonic and there's this one level on sonic it's the oil zone and every time I played the oil zone as a kid, I had those uh, plain animal crackers and I would just sit there and eat them while I played Sonic. And so to this day, whenever I see pictures of that zone, whenever I, if I go home and I play that game, I have this enormous craving for plain animal crackers. <laughs> it's a really strong association. <laughs> so then my, my last question regarding the matrix, or actually I have two. So one, and I'm not sure if we can answer this. I bet I can. Okay. Yeah. The answer no, is no. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Then I won't even ask it. <laughs> we'll go on to the next one. The, the, so what would be more helpful 
for them, for like uh, for Neo to review his kung fu? Would it be to practice it, or would it be to just、uh, re-upload it? Well, re-uploading it would be faster. It would, it would. But would re-uploading it? So it's like if you could replace a memory with a new one. I guess that's not the way our brain works, right? No, because you couldn't just write over a pre-existing memory to kind of make it all brand spanking new. But I wonder what effect re-uploading it would have on the old one. Would it reinforce it, or would it kind of just double up? I don't. I don't know. Well, I mean, think about your experiences. Have you ever, for example, taken an algebra class in high school and then had to take an algebra class again in college? Sure. You're, but... you're basically re-uploading the same information, and、uh, yeah. Yeah. for for me, it just was like, oh, I get that now. Yeah. And it was it was easier to access because the foundation had already been laid. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because you're building upon something that was already there. Right. Not necessarily. You can't kind of like,、oh, I want to forget everything I knew before and start over.、Um, although there are some topics that we kind of like, sometimes you you look at a problem in a certain way and you can't tackle it that way, and then you kind of come at it from a whole other side with a new method, and then that does make it different. But I'm not sure that it exactly applies. Well, it's kind of like the argument of human beings having infinite space to hold memories, and again, the the recall and storage might is where we get screwed up.、Yeah. The opposite of that argument is every time you you have a, a finite amount, and then once you hit that finite amount, it's like your email when you hit your limit, the last email or the the oldest one gets deleted. So the idea that by creating new memories, you're actually pushing out or deleting old ones. I don't ascribe to that personally, but that is that is the, kind of the other side of the argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it's it's more like it's it's, it's all the same thing, but、uh, to word it、um, a way that I feel more comfortable with, anyway, is that your brain has an it may have an infinite capability to create new memories, but like you said, then just accessing them, like even if it was something like、uh, if you wanted to visualize it, like you know, like a drawer or a, or a hard drive or something like that. It would get so big that you can't. It's just really hard to reach that other end sometimes, and it's just a lot easier to reach the things that are closer. And I, oh, I, oh you have one more question about the Matrix, right? I do. Okay. I do. Okay. Go for it. I'll hold on.、Yeah. You sure?、Is、yeah. I'll hold on.、Right. I'll, I'll、okay. remember it. Okay. Maybe. So, is it possible to do what they do in the Matrix? Is it possible to upload? Um, information into a person's brain, or will it? And will it ever be possible? I think it'll definitely be possible because、yeah. science fiction is really good at predicting <laughs> things that happen in the future. I know right now there are currently neurotropic drugs that are able to increase attention and are able to boost memory and are able to do all these different cognitive functions that are almost like super brains compared to to where we are now, and. When you're kind of listening to a podcast, like you mentioned earlier, it's it's kind of almost the same thing as that you're getting information from an avenue other than reading, which is what we normally do, or physically doing something, which is another way that we we tend to learn things and tend to remember things. I think it's definitely going to happen at some point. I don't know if I will be alive, and I can guarantee you, if it involves a needle being jabbed into my brainstem, I will not be on that boat. I don't care what it could teach me, but I don't know if that's the exact method for which, you know, that kind of thing will be delivered. Probably not. But the idea of being able to just upload knowledge, I think, is not not as far away as we might think. So speculation is half the fun for this for this、yeah. podcast, right? And so a little research found out that we're actually way way closer than you would think. So a few years ago, I found two different experiments that were really interesting. One involved actually reading. Um, human human brain while it was perceiving particular information, right? Actually, I just remembered a third thing. Have you ever seen those、uh, recreations of a memory done by a computer, where they're reading the mind and then they can kind of make out a picture that the person is looking at? Oh, I haven't heard that. Yeah. So so what's happening is right. All those different places in your brain are firing up, and we can measure that with enough detail now that we can say, okay, so when the One trillion different possible locations where there could be an electrical signal、um, light up in the human brain in this particular combination. That means this or that. 
So if you start, if, if we're able to break it down and kind of, you know, reverse engineer memories in the brain to that point, the idea is that we could kind of map that out and then send that signal. So uh, a few years ago, I mean, this is uh, aside from the from the picture recreation that is like mind blowing. Um, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll look that up and put it in the show notes too. But then there's this experiment where they took fMRI, right, to scan people's brains uh, when they were learning particular things, like seeing particular shapes, and then they took that image and tried to recreate it by exposing people again through fMRI to kind of push that exact pattern onto their brain and it kind of worked so they were able to identify when they were looking at different objects and then make them essentially see or remember different objects through fmri crazy i I guess it's not super surprising because again as we talked about our our memories are so malleable the fact that you can have memories that you think are yours but really aren't I know this happens a lot with children. For example, there's a, a picture of me when I was very little, uh, red hair, uh, red velveteen dress, white little tights, black buckle shoes. And I would swear to you up and down that that is my memory, that I remember that. But I was only maybe, maybe a year old. So there's no way, there's no way I can actually have remembered that. But there is a picture of me in my family's album of me in that exact same outfit in the exact same way I picture myself. So the idea that we can imprint something upon our brains is nothing new, but the the way that we can actually, that we can physically do it, that is very new and exciting. And as with all things, technology, psychology, a little bit scary. Terrifying. Absolutely <laughs> terrifying. And now this, this research was, uh, the experiment was really basic. It was just kind of um, shapes and things like that. But again, I mean, you know, inception, what if it was an idea that you could implant into a person, right? If we could identify what an idea looked like. Oh, and come kind of on, push Jose. That into people. What? Come on. Women yeah. have been doing that with men for generations. So I'm glad you brought that up so we can talk about how they project this. Uh, <laughs> it's like a radar, right? And they're electrical signals that they're pushing onto people's brains. That's the way it works, right? Essentially? Sure. Just like the fMRI machine? Yeah. Yeah. We figured it out. Yes. <laughs> Women are fMRI machines. That's what the, actually the F in fMRI stands for. It's not functional. It's female. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Female, <laughs> male, reading enhancement. No, enhancement to the knee. Uh, induction. We'll go with induction. Ooh. Okay. Or okay. something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't quote us on that. This is... It may turn out to be true, though. It may turn out to be true. Um, so th- those, those experiments kind of blew my mind. Oh, no, no, I forgot the last one. So the other one is that they, um, so researchers took and actually installed a hard drive into rats so that they could essentially, the same thing I'm talking about, like that image of a memory, um, all those synapses firing at one particular time, they were able to record that and then put it into a hard drive that was connected to a rat. And apparently it, uh, it helped them with recall. And I don't remember the specifics. I'm just giving you like an overview. Uh, but the idea is that it's kind of like having a backup to your brain. So you could actually mm-hmm. put those. And, and that will be relevant uh, in a future episode. I was going to say, oh, ooh, ooh, are we talking about episode no. three of Black Mirror? Because that's the no. perfect segue. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. it hurts. So that's a teaser. That's a teaser. So that idea is actually kind of plausible. So I'll just leave it at that and then talk about that in a, in a future episode. All right. So then to, to, to wrap it up, I guess, uh, what do you use or what have you seen or do you use anything that can kind of help you um, help you improve memory? We're not we're not in the matrix yet. Um, I talked about how for me, learning has completely changed now that I'm always listening to audiobooks. I'm always looking at different ways to recall information more efficiently. And I'm actually trying to adopt the concept of, of space repetition in my life on a regular basis for things that are more important using software that has those algorithms already built in and can actually help me figure out the best way to recall uh, memories and, and when, and for example, I almost cheated when you gave me those five words because I have Evernote right in front of me. I use Evernote all the time for everything. 
I've gotten to the point where everything in my life that's like a document or anything interesting goes into Evernote now so I can retrieve it. That's my little hard drive. And I have I have our, our topics of discussion here on Evernote right now. And I almost, almost wrote down the five words just to make a point that we could use uh, different things to to assist with um, memory and recall in a certain way. So so those are kind of things that I, I've been doing. What 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 do you recommend or what, what thoughts do you have? Well, I have used the Mind Palace before, before mm-hmm. Sherlock, actually. It was to help with psychology. I was studying. I just imagined my house and I found places to put things. So if I was trying to remember something about uh, something to do with cold, I would put it in the fridge. If there was something to do with chemicals, I would put it under the sink. And, you know, so I had this mind palace. So I've, I've tried that. Mnemonics work for me very, very well. I remember for comps, which is our, our kind of our internal, if you can't pass it, you can't graduate kind of test. And we had to memorize basically how to do um, conceptualizations from three different orientations. And so I had, I had mnemonics for each of those orientations so I could remember like step by step how, how they laid out. And that was really helpful. As silly as it sounds, putting something to song is really, really helpful for me. And so if I can take like a Backstreet Boys and just rewrite the lyrics to whatever it is I'm trying to learn, that tends to be incredibly, <laughs> incredibly efficient. Uh, again, because that whole auditory uh, processing that I have. And the fact that I am still in school, that I went back to school, the fact that my brain is constantly working in overdrive mode is also helping with the overall health of my brain, and uh, which of course bleeds over into the, the memory portion of it. No, I haven't actually looked up to see if people actually do this, but the idea of the Mind Palace, I thought about using um, 3D rendering software to create kind of a room and then put information in it so that when, when I studied it, I could actually review a 3D model with Ooh. the information in different places and different objects. Um, and I think that that would help me because I would probably forget the Mind Palace because my memory is not all that great. <laughs> So, Josue, are you saying you want me to create a mind palace for you in Blender and then send it to you and you can fill it with goodies? Um, only if it doesn't make you pull your hair out. <laughs> okay, well, We not can yet. wait a couple months. <laughs> till... <laughs> oh, man. And on recording stuff, too. I mean, just like we're recording an episode now, um, and I think that's really helpful. It's actually, whether it's a song that you rewrote or just notes that you want to take and just snippets to be able to, you know, record that and kind of tell it to yourself again um, through a recording um, is just like a, a simple way to to kind of re- help with recall. Well, I know there's a, there's a very poetic saying, and I unfortunately can't remember uh, who actually said it first, but if you speak, I listen. If you teach, I learn. If you have me, or if you do, I remember. So the idea of physically engaging in something having it be an activity rather than a lecture, being able to take part in something leaves a stronger impact in your memory than being a passive recipient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if for, for any, for a good example, um, I think, I think that with language learning, I mean, you even brought that up. I think it's something that, um, we can learn a lot from regarding memory and, and learning, um, just really good language software called Duolingo. Uh, it was a pretty popular app. I mean, it's still a popular app, but it won um, Apple and Google Play App of the Year. I think it was 2012, maybe 2013. And it uses a lot of the principles that we're, we're talking about here, specifically that space repetition. You can actually, so you start learning something, and then over time, you can see a little bar that kind of weakens. And that's its way of visually telling you, hey, it's been a while since you practiced this. We should bring this back up. And then it's a visual representation of all these different concepts and how well you know them or you don't. And you can go ahead and try to learn a language while you're at it. So that's a, I, I recommend that as kind of a, a cool piece of tech that we have now that is using those ideas. And, and it also lets you do things with the information that you're learning to kind of help reinforce all of that. You just cued example. my memory because uh-huh. I was going to say something about that spaced recall. Okay. And that is that... It has recently become very apparent that sleeping has a ton to do with the ability to consolidate memories. So I'm wondering if one of the reasons that spaced recall works is because you probably sleep 
in between those sessions. And they've shown that during sleep, the memories that are in your short-term or working memory, that is when they get consolidated into long-term memory. Yep. I didn't bring that up either because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really come up with uh, um, any information on how well or not they sleep in the matrix. <laughs> right. But, but you're absolutely right. We know that um, without, like you could cram for a day and then if you don't sleep, it's like wasted effort because while you're sleeping, your brain is then taking that information. And then although it's not like a file cabinet, it's that's when it kind of files it away and and tags it and makes it um, more easily accessible and reinforces everything that you learned that day and makes it easier for recall later. Absolutely. Yeah. When you sleep, that's when the Roomba comes in and, and tidies things up. Excellent. Excellent analogy. Perfect. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So that's all I got on the Matrix, and uh, I want to talk about the Matrix every week. But that's all I have on the Matrix and memory. Um, so, so I think that that's it for us today. And uh, before we go, I just wanted to mention that next week we're going to be at PAX East in Boston. Um, so specifically, we're going to be we'll, we'll be there all weekend, but we're going to be giving a presentation on March seventh. That's Saturday at six thirty on how video games are good for you. It's going to we'll be have... wicked awesome. Yes, and we'll have two other uh, psychology people there, um, and we'll be talking about that, just uh, how they're good for you, and um, check it out if you're in the area, um, or if you want to know about it and you can't make it there, just contact us and we'll we'll give you some info. So that's a look up PAX East in Boston. And uh, you can find out uh, way more about the show and find the show notes at psychtechpodcast.com. Find us on Twitter at psychtechcast. And for PsychTech, I am Josue Cardona. I'm Kelly Dunlap. And if you don't want to forget the things we talked about, listen to it again uh, with a few days in between. There you go. All right.